I think about the pastors who, who are brash with their words, who belittle people, who berate people from the pulpit, um, or maybe who've exploited it. And I, I you know, I, I, I want us to be tender with the people who have been hurt by the church and who have been disillusioned because of the failures and, and to listen to them, to kind of help, you know, uh, walk with them. The, the picture in my mind, Joanna, is Luke 24. The disciples are walking away from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus, and they're walking away sad. But Jesus, post-resurrection Jesus, like Jesus in all his glory, goes incognito. He goes low. And I think that's what we need to do as the church. We need to go low and find people who are walking away sad and come alongside them and say, what, what happened? What things? What things have happened here in Jerusalem? And then Jesus tells them this a story that's more beautiful than the story they had heard. And like you said a moment ago, it, it is good news. Hey friends, welcome to the Word Made Digital Podcast on YouTube. I'm the host, Joanne LaFleur, and this is season eight of the podcast. Thanks for joining, for catching these episodes. We're leaning into hope and positivity for the future because it's been a rough couple of years. So enjoy this episode of the podcast. And hey, if you want to check out seven seasons of archives of the podcast, as well as tutorials, practical help for you in church communications, creative, websites, social media, we got it all here on the YouTube channel. So subscribe now and enjoy this episode. Glenn Packy, and welcome to Word Made Digital. Really glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Joanna. Good to talk to you today. Um, as Can you please give us a means of introduction? What's the Coles notes on, I mean, you're in the pastoring world, you've got family life, you're also part of Barna content. So What's what's going on? <laughs> well, I've uh, yeah, lots going on. I've been at the same local church for 22 years, New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Started out as a worship leader and and did several worship projects with them for the first eight or nine years of my time, and then switched into kind of this teaching pastoral role. And then ten years ago, we planted a congregation that's still part of New Life, but called New Life Downtown. And I serve as associate senior pastor at the church, so I help oversee a lot of our off-site congregations. And yeah, over the last year or so, I've started doing some work with Barna, uh, a little bit on the side. Uh, they made up a fancy title for it, Senior Fellow at the Barna Group. It just means um, I can access all of their wonderful research, and they can call on me to uh, to speak <laughs> to speak on some of those things. So, And of course, this project, the Resilient Pastor uh, book, and all the initiatives is a big part of that whole uh, partnership with Barna. And so I, I imagine at some level, your partnership comes out of you maybe have a passion for research and data and, you know, what is the thing behind the thing? Is that fair? Yeah, that is fair. And and yeah, and it, it developed for me as I was doing my doctoral work in Durham University in the UK. And I encountered a model of what they call practical theology. A lot of times in America, especially in evangelical seminaries, you say practical theology and people think, oh, it's applied theology, like how to preach and how to counsel and all that's fine and good. But over there, I encountered a model that actually was trying to bring situational analysis in um, conversation, if you will, with theology. So you go deep on analyzing a situation and then you reflect biblically and theologically on it. And so anyway, in, in doing my doctoral work there, I really kind of fell in love with that approach to with qualitative research, quantitative research, basically trying to get a, a proper view of the situation and then thinking biblically and theologically about it. So when David Kinneman, the president of Barna, approached me about this idea for a book in early 2020, you know, pre-pandemic, um, oh, it I was said, pre, yeah, that's interesting. Pre-pandemic, this conversation was already in, in the mix. Yeah. Well, like maybe two weeks pre-pandemic. I mean, really right before it. And I was excited. I thought, man, this is great. A, a book for pastors and the challenges of a changing world. And after the pandemic broke out, Joanna, I kind of feel like I got tricked by the Lord, you know, because... <laughs> Because the work just got harder. But of course, we we all recognized, the team at Barna and I, that the work became more urgent. So I got to outline yeah. these eight challenges, four for the pastor and four for the church, and then work with their research team to design um, you know, how, what kind of questions we would ask and questions of pastors and questions of um, you, you know, the general population. And then I went and tried to take it a little bit further by having some focus groups with pastors from Canada, the U.S., and the U.K., just to hear the stories behind the stats, you know, and and and, uh, 
give a, a bit more depth to some of the insight that we were gaining. And then, of course, the goal was to pair that insight with wisdom and wisdom from church history, right. wisdom from the scriptures and, and all that. So that's the goal of the project. Well, it's, I mean, the, the, the resilient pastor and then the subtitle leading your church in a rapidly changing world. I'm curious about how you even gather the data because in a rapidly changing world, as soon as it goes to print, I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but as soon as it goes to print, it's out of date. <laughs> Maybe not yeah. literally, but, but that may be how the, it would feel like whatever the yeah. data was six months ago may not be some of the data today. It, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's a really, I'll, t I'll tell you, Joanna, that's the stuff that kept me up at night thinking, oh my goodness, how do we keep, you know, and it's one of the reasons, you know, we were able to stagger some of this stuff, but also we were able to do tracking data. So the great thing about okay. working with Barna is in a lot of the questions we were asking for the, for this project, they were questions they had asked before. So Barna's done like right. the state of the pastor and the state of the church. They've done in-depth studies on discipleship, on racial tensions, on political divisions, all of that stuff. So some of the questions in the book were pulled from very current data. And then some of it was like we could track it. So even if the specific statistic may not be, you know, yesterday's news or, or, or sorry, not yesterday, like as, as recent as yesterday, um, we can at least sort of see trajectories and trends. And that's mm -hmm. what we're looking for. We're not necessarily trying to peg specific numbers, but to say, is this headed in a downward way or is this headed in an upward way? Right. And and that helps us reflect. So, I mean, give us some of these trends. The, the first thing I'm thinking about, we're, we're in this time of where people, the great resignation people are talking yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, I think in the younger generation, there's this, you know, everybody wants to be a YouTube star or just this, maybe that's more of a reflection on this idea of there are so many new ways to make money <laughs> yeah. or, yeah. or ways to even have community, you know, the place of the local church, the local pastor, that is a vocation. I'd love for you to give us some insight. Uh, maybe what are some of those? And we can jump then from there and deep dive into a few of them. But what well, are some several, of these big things you're looking at? Yeah, there's several things. And one of the, one of the questions that uh, Barna actually did apart from the study for this book was about, you know, pastors who had seriously considered quitting vocational ministry. And that number was 29% in January of 2021. Not that okay. had actually quit, but were seriously considering quitting. And I'm always careful when I say this uh, series of statistics because it's not a it's not a bad thing to quit local church um, ministry. In fact, your calling can be lived out in many different containers, mm -hmm. and and so there there's sometimes where people will say my calling hasn't changed. It's just this, this the context uh, has changed for it, and so that's okay. But what we're trying to get behind with those numbers is to say. Well, is there a deeper discouragement? Is there something else that's going on here? So 29% in January of 2021. In October of 2021, that number rose to 38%. And then wow. and then uh, just recently, March of this year, March of 2022, that number is in the 42, 43% range. So again, if we, if we don't just uh, look at specific numbers, but pay attention to trends and trajectories, this is trending in the wrong direction. More and more pastors are seriously considering quitting um, vocational ministry. And I think that speaks to the discouragement that speaks to, you know, we did some, some data in, uh, in the book about vocation itself. Like what is our calling? Now, one of the questions we asked that we were able to track was from 2015. They had asked, uh, are you more confident today than when you first entered ministry or, you know, less confident, more confident. And then we asked that question again in late 2020. And basically, Joanna, I mean, the nutshell is, more pastors are less confident of their calling than when they first mm. began, and fewer pastors are more confident of their calling than when they first mm. began. So not only are pastors seriously considering quitting, but there's also this shakiness in our sense of vocation. Right. And <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm I'm always thinking, you know, how does that compare to all the people who sit in the pews, metaphorical or, or literal, yeah. you know, do they feel less confident in their profession or more confident, mm -hmm. you know, whether their calling is, mm -hmm. you know, and calling is even then a complicated word theologically, yeah. but, yeah. but broadly speaking around, you know, it's education or it's justice and law issues, or it's, you know, uh, your primary focus of your life is at home and whether you have a job or not, you don't care much about it because your primary focus is on your family life or, you know, whatever it may yeah. be. Um, yeah, there is just this huge shift and 
it has been like a very discouraging time. You know, where where we started before we hit record, you know, I said that right before the pandemic began, I couldn't have known, but I left my local church work I'd been doing for 12 mm. years mm. Uh, to do what I do here with Word Made yeah. Digital yeah. in a full-time capacity. I couldn't do it any longer on the side. It, it had to take my full attention. And I let, and we kind of joke like, wow, I kind of, in some ways I can say I got out just in time. And what I mean by that is the last few years have just been really um, yeah. rough. And what do you think some of those things are, particularly though for pastors or for ministry people, yeah. Compared to, you know, those listening who have other or those listening, or we know all these people who have a thousand right. other professions, but what is it about ministry work? Well, and I, you know, you raise a great point, Joanna. I, I would not want to say that, oh, poor pastors, we have it harder than anyone else. I don't want to say that. And I don't know that. In fact, I could think of lots of professions just anecdotally, you know, people in our church in healthcare and in education, just to give two examples, yeah. um, who have had a very, very difficult last two or three years, you know, so, so I don't at all want to make it sound like, oh, gosh, this is the hardest job in the world and poor pastors. I, I think everybody's been under strain, but I can speak to the particular ways the pastoral job has become harder and more complicated. Mm. And again, that's not to say it's more complicated than anyone else's. It's just more complicated than it has been in the past. And one of the reasons for that is this sort of stacking expectations that happens to pastors. So, you know, it, I, I think over the decades, we've had these different visions or expectations of what a pastor should be or shouldn't be. Okay, they ought to be, uh, they ought to know the Bible really well. They ought to be some something of a, a, a you know, well-versed in theology maybe. And then over time that became, well, they got to be a therapist and they got to understand counseling theories and mm -hmm. they got to be able to help marriages. And, and then it was, no, 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 they've got to be entrepreneurs and amazing leaders. And they've got to read the latest article from Harvard Business Review. And then it's, no, 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 they, they've got to be um, <laughs> politi you know, political commentators. They need to tell us, you know, which issues really matter and what the consequences will be. No, 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 they need to be social activists. And the thing is, all of those things are, they're not unfair expectations in the sense that we could look at the scripture and say, well, hang on, we're just asking for our leaders to be like the prophets or to be like the teachers or to be, you know, so they're not necessarily unfair. What makes them unfair is when they sort of stack and you expect one individual to be all of those things, which mm -hmm. we surely cannot be. So not only is there sort of these stacking compound interest, if you will, in terms of expectations, compound interest that's draining us. You know, we're, uh, if we stretch that metaphor a little bit, pastors are in debt uh, in, the, in the equation here because it's impossible for us to recover. But, but the other comp compl complication, complication in this, Joanna, is... Um, the social media and digital world that we're in because, and even during the pandemic, maybe this sort of accelerated it. We were telling people to go online and join church and, and all of that watch on YouTube, which, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. We're trying to do the best that we can. Some churches were late in adopting and this forced them to get there. But over time in the pandemic, people started to figure out, look, if I'm watching a service online, I don't want to watch my service with sort of average music and moderate preaching i want to i want to mm. watch the you know the, the pros and so yeah I, some of the pastors in my focus group expressed that discouragement they said it didn't take long before our parishioners began watching the quote unquote hot preacher or, or whatever the 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 trendy church and and yeah. that was a real source of discouragement because now not only do we have these stacked expectations compound interest or whatever we also have the comparison game where because everybody was digital, you scroll Facebook on a Sunday and you, you know, pick which church you want to watch. It was hard. Yeah. And your your message is constantly being compared or your music yeah. is being, it's the comparison. Even if they are watching yours too, it's not sure. as good as, you know, pick your favorite person. And then meanwhile, there's all these implosions of leadership publicly. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this is all happening. So maybe you've been watching. Like that's literally, uh, I've had this conversation just in our local Ontario context, a mm. church that would have been one of the places, the mega churches that drew people yeah. in. There's just very recently been, you know, a very public leadership yeah. failure, moral issues, uh, ongoing, whatever. The point is that people say, now, where do I go? What do I do yeah. now? Because this yeah. was the place. I don't know what to do next. Um 
to to kind of move out of like we all know you know there's a lot of negative stuff here uh i want to keep diagnosing it if we don't diagnose it well we can't yes get the right medicine um but i'm particularly interested in your context because you said you studied in the uk at least mm-hmm. for your phd maybe mm-hmm. other uh, no, studies just, yeah just the doctor okay well and and my understanding is i think you were uh malaysian born yeah yeah and i was so, born yeah go ahead well, just I, I'd like to get. Can you give us some context for that? Because sure. what we're talking about, in some ways, is this sort of Western dynamic mm-hmm. where the church is thriving in many other places, or even more so, the church has been post-Christian and secular in the UK for a yeah. very long time. So, I guess I'm curious about this piece of how you view things. This yeah. is as part of your view into the conversation. I definitely this global think the- idea. Yeah, I definitely think the global church is a huge, um, we, we need the perspective of the global church. And in the book, I try to offer the perspective of the historic church as well, because mm-hmm. I kind of got tired during the pandemic, Joanna, of people saying, oh, this is unprecedented. This is unprecedented. And I want to say, well, did you, have you read about the church in Carthage in the 300s? I mean, it was pretty bad with the Donatist controversy and the plagues, you know. So there's there's a lot of other eras of church history that have had it really difficult that we can that we can learn from and the global church. So I was born and raised in Malaysia. That's where I'm from uh, originally. When I was ten, we moved from Malaysia to the U.S. My parents went to a Bible college in Portland, Oregon, and then we moved back to Malaysia uh, after three years in the states. And I finished out my high school years in Malaysia, and then I came to the states to go to college. And then when I did my doctoral work, 2013 to 2018, it was part time, which meant I was doing, I was commuting um, to to mm. the UK. I, I think I made close to 20 trips in the last, you know, wow. whatever, five or six years, you know, seven years. And and got to make a lot of good friends with with pastors over in the UK and understand a little bit more their uh, their context, and it is post Christian and yet they have this sort of institutional church that holds some strange power in in certain places. You know, one mm. of the pastors in my focus group is a Hong Kong born British uh, Chinese, and he said when he wears his priestly collar, the dog collar as they call it. Uh, you know, it actually gains some respect and some credibility hmm. um, versus some of the American pastors in my focus groups are like, yeah, I don't tell anybody that I'm a pastor because I, I don't want to shut down the, the conversation on the airplane or whatever, you hmm. know. But you you bring up the scandals, Joanna, and that's it's a really important thing because the credibility crisis, that was one of the other challenges. So we talked about the challenge of vocation, but the challenge of credibility was another sort of eye-opening piece of data because when we when we looked at it you know we, one of the questions we asked was would you consider a pastor a trustworthy source of wisdom and uh you know it's not surprising that four percent of non-christians said yes absolutely maybe that's lower than we would have liked four percent is pretty low 18 wow. percent said yes somewhat so you add that together you have less than a quarter of u.s adults say yeah a pastor is a trustworthy source um, of wisdom but what was maybe even more disturbing is is Christians. So you had a combined 31% plus 40%, 31% who said yes, absolutely, 40% who said yes, somewhat. 71% of Christians, self-described Christians, say a pastor is at least somewhat a trustworthy source of wisdom. So I'll, I'll you know, we've been on the road a little bit talk, doing some of these resilient pastor roundtables in various cities and I'll joke with the pastors there. I'll say that means about a third of the people in our congregations on any given weekend are listening to us and saying, yeah, maybe. And they always laugh right. because they think, yeah, that sounds about right. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> and so <laughs> uh, you talk about this idea and maybe it's, it's relating uh, to mm-hmm. this, uh, the idea of the new kind of pluralism in the West. Yeah. And maybe yeah. I'm jumping off from that because it's almost sort of this pluralism is in we pick the idea from the pastor, we pick the idea from social media, we pick the mm-hmm. idea that we like in politics, pick, pick, pick. Talk to us about this. What are what are you yeah. seeing happening here? I love that you're making that connection with this sort of um, the, the decline in credibility, because I do think one of the reasons why people don't view the, the pastor as a trustworthy source of wisdom is because they have other sources of wisdom in their life, and they kind of place themselves 
at the center of deciding what is wisdom and what is not. And so it's a different age than, you know, it used to be maybe you would say, well, there is a truth or there is a wisdom out there and we've got to try to discern it or discover it. And now there's a there's much more. And of course, this has been building for a long time, right? Postmodernism has been in the works for, for a few decades now. I, I think in some ways the pandemic accelerated it because it forced us inward. It forced us into isolation. And so we really did start to believe that, okay, well, if it's just me at home scrolling YouTube or Instagram or TikTok and deciding which influencer, quote unquote, to listen to, then I'll just mix and match. I like a little of what she says and what he says and what they'll do. So the new pluralism is a mix and match kind of um, pluralism. And I, I say new because, again, you know, growing up in Malaysia, that's sort of the, the the classic sense of pluralism, where there's many different religions, but they all just sort of peacefully, um, you know, coexist with one another. So Christians were about 11 percent. Muslims are about 45 percent or so. And then the rest are made up of Buddhists and Hindus. But nobody nobody said silly things like, well, Allah and Jesus are essentially the same or I'll have a little mm. Buddha and then a little, you know, no, nobody said silly things like that. But in the West, um, there is a kind of Western arrogance in this, Joanna, a little bit of a it's a little bit of that imperialistic uh, impulse where just as Western empires at one point moved people around the globe to work on plantations, now we move ideas around the world and say, well, I don't care that this is an ancient religion. I'll just take a little bit from them and a little bit from this because after all, I'm the center of it. So if you like, we're an empire of one, you know, where every person mm. is the emperor to themselves who can decide what what truth really is. And that that just makes our, our work as pastors more complicated um, as we the try empire to empire of one. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then, of course, the, the, the classic story, it makes me think of immediately the emperor is wearing no clothes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, you right. know, everyone's trying to, I got, at some level, I'm okay. I've got it together. I figure I have this with, you know, I've even, I've, I've uh, recently in some of the stuff like Glennon Doyle or, mm. or, and I just use that as a quick reference because I've heard yeah. others talk like it, but thinking of what struck me out of this kind of direction of, sort of post-Christian writing, uh, is this, it is the individual as empire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, on a personal note, my, my father has uh, dementia and is in a home. Mm -hmm. And so a, a Christian man who no longer can sort of have an empire of himself, you know, he was mm -hmm. once the nuclear engineer and is now, you know, unable to, to do many things anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and yet in this kind of pluralistic conversation, I'm seeing it's what you think at the end of the day, it's about you and what you want and your power and your freedom mm. and your self-actualization when, when like for many people, there will come a point in our life where we literally cannot do that. Yes. We must have other people. <laughs> we cannot think for ourselves. Our brain won't, our brain will betray us. I don't mean that out of fear. It's just honesty that if well, all we have is ourself, where does that leave us? It's so true, and I'm so sorry for what you're going through with, with your dad, and and that that's such a difficult thing to see. I think I think often in those uh, in these moments about the the black Scottish theologian John Swinton, um, who says in the and he works a lot with dementia, does a lot of work. Uh, he spent a lot of work as in healthcare first before he did his theological training. Uh, with dementia patients. And so he he says, in the end, it's not our memory of God that counts, but God's memory of us. And wow. I think that is so beautiful because, again, we, we, we're we trying to construct a version of reality where we stand at the center of it and we'll take ideas mm. from here. And, and, you know, I mentioned in the book other kind of uh, influences in this moment. You mentioned the new pluralism, there's a new kind of paganism, but there's this hyper uh, exclusive individualism. Charles Taylor called it that. The Canadian uh, born philosopher Charles Taylor called it this expressive individualism, um, which all of these things are interconnected, you know? So if we want to place ourselves at the center and we'll decide who's, who's right and who's wrong, and then everyone else needs to agree with me, otherwise I'll cut them out and, and label them as toxic just for disagreeing, you know? That's where we're at today. But at some point, like you said, not only are we going to need other people, but we're going to need to count on a God, a love that is larger mm. than us, a love that is larger than ourselves that can say, it, it really doesn't matter whether you uh, remember me or know me, I know you and I remember you. And that wow. to me is the power of the gospel. 
Yeah. Well, and that's, and, and when we say gospel, good news, yeah. like the yeah. good news is it doesn't have to all be carried on your shoulders. Yes. Uh, and that's the lostness, I think, of so many people. They do feel when I hear those, uh, those kinds of directions of ph philosophical or theological directions of, you know, it's yourself, sort of this self-contained thing. And at the end of the day, you have no one else. You just have yourself. I mean, it's just, it's just not true right. that we can actually rely on a God who sees us and loves us uh, and a community of faith around us. And yet yeah. we keep uh, leaving the church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People are, you know, people are leaving that community and that sense of a place that can care for us. Um, uh, there's, there's so many threads to pull here. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to decide which way to go next, but maybe I'll just say to you, you know, um, you know, what's your sort of continued, you know, your reaction to this? Um, yeah, I think there is, there's a need for great empathy for people who are walking away or have walked away. Um, because we, we the, the the truth is the church has given them cause, you know, has given them reasons. We mentioned the scandals, but there's more than that. In the chapter on credibility, I talk about all the different ways that we are tempted to misuse power, and the Bible's story of Saul is is a cautionary tale. You know, Samuel mm. tells the people, "Be careful what you wish for. If you want a king, you know, kings take." And so the, that first temptation of power is to leverage your position for your own benefit. And that man, how many times have Again, not all pastors. In fact, many pastors are good, faithful, humble servants of the Lord. But we are implicated because of the pastors who have leveraged their position for their own comfort. Or the second thing Saul does, he steps outside his lane and starts trying to act like a priest and offer sacrifices, and he gets rebuked for that. And I think of the version of that, I, I think of when pastors try to, to speak about mental health with the sort of bravado that they don't know, they don't understand. And they say, well, don't worry, you just your anxiety, just pray more or whatever. Or they try to speak about, <laughs> you know, they try to speak yeah. about political issues. And it's like, you don't know anything about um, this, this complicated policy. I had a friend who's a, a, a politician. He said, Glenn, I cringe when pastors try to, to make policies sound so simplistic. Every solution creates new problems, and it's just not that simple, you know. And, and so, but pastors, we, we do that. We, we go outside our lanes and speak with too much bravado, and it's turned people off. And then thirdly, Saul does this thing where he makes this brash and hasty vow that whoever, you know, ate uh, would be killed. And then his son, come to find out his son had eaten honey, you know. And I, yeah. I, when I think mm -hmm. about that, I, I think about the pastors who who are brash with their words, who belittle people, who berate people from the pulpit, um, or maybe who've exploited it. And I, I, you know, I I I want us to be tender with the people who have been hurt by the church and who have been disillusioned because of the failures, and and to listen to them, to kind of help, you know, uh, walk with them. The, the picture in my mind, Joanna, is Luke 24. You know, the disciples are walking away from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus, and they're walking away sad. But Jesus, post-resurrection Jesus, like Jesus in all his glory, goes incognito. He goes low. And I think that's what we need to do as the church. We need to go low and find people who are walking away sad and come alongside them and say, mm. what what happened? What things? What things have happened here in Jerusalem? And and then Jesus tells them this a story that's more beautiful than the story they had heard. And like you said a moment ago, it, it is good news. Um, we do have good news. Even when we fail by its own standards, uh, even when we fall short, we're falling short by the measure of Jesus. And Jesus, his life and death and resurrection is still good news. Mm. Well, and and what I often say here with We're Made Digital, you know, the, the gospel isn't just good news. It's the best news. Yeah in the world. And if we have the best news, we should be the best communicators, but we're just <laughs> so bad at communicating. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, my, you know, my work and is, is largely to help communicate good news, uh, more effectively. I um, love that. and, and there's lots, there's lots of room for growth for sure. And I have so much to learn every day. I mean, the way we communicate is change. I mean, just on the technology side alone, I mean, how we're communicating yeah. is changing. Um, but I love that this pressure, you're describing this pressure to be the expert at all the things, <laughs> which is maybe why the 30% of people are sitting in your your church service saying, like, you're clearly not an expert at this right. thing. Why are you even talking about it? But then what do we do when, 
you know, do you have any pastoral advice or wisdom here? Because I think there's this pressure if you're a leader to speak mm -hmm. on all the things. Um, yeah. You know, just as we record, there was just very, very close to where I live in Toronto, Buffalo, there was this yep. shooting in the last a couple of days, horrifying mm -hmm. racial based mm -hmm. violence, uh, evil. Uh, and so then you think, well, sh should I, should I, po I haven't at this point, should, should we post something about it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people would say you should post about everything. Don't you care yeah. about black lives? You know, all that. and mm -hmm. then other people say, well, you're not an expert on this issue. So don't post anything. What about the yeah. church? What a, should the church post? Should the pastor post? <laughs> What's your wisdom here? On how well, do you, <laughs> if we're not an expert, how do you, how do you do this? <laughs> how do you I, navigate it? Well, let me take the question first, the way you phrased it there, if we're not an expert, I, I think we should stay away from topics that require expertise, or at least speaking about them in, in, in a complex way. Um, mm -hmm. However, when there are tragedies or there's something to lament, what we can offer is that voice of solidarity, that voice of lament, that voice of acknowledgement of pain. Um, without so so i'll give you an example so yesterday in church i did comment on on the shooting that happened in buffalo and my sermon was on the spirit as the giver of gifts it had nothing to do with spiritual gifts except that it kind of does and i talked about how mm. one of the reasons the spirit gives gifts is to help the church be a witness in the world and i said yesterday you know this happened a, a self-described you know a white supremacist open fire in a black neighborhood deliberately trying to kill and and i paused and I said, we understand why there's so much anxiety and fear in the black community. So that's an act of listening more than it is offering advice. That's the result of me saying, yeah, actually, when you when you listen to voices in the black community say every time another one of these things happen, we say we start shaking, we start, uh, you know, so I, acknowledgement of someone else's pain. And then the, I went on to say the thing that I am trained to say, which is. The theology part of this, the spirit empowers the church not to have, uh, you know, you know, great services, but so we can go out into the world with reconciliation and peacemaking and justice and all of that, and mm. be, to be agents of healing, and and that's where that's the way that I chose to to address the issue. So I think there are ways of doing it that uh, keep you grounded, but don't don't let you be. Um, sort of silent on, on, on things that need to be talked about. In general, uh, I, I think one of the things I try to do is I try to think about biblical categories. Like, what are the biblical categories for this? So justice, peace, love, what are the words the Bible uses? And then I try to think about kingdom priorities. And what I mean by that specifically is let's look at the life of Jesus. Where was Jesus's priorities in terms of his mission and his ministry? Okay, how can I make those my priorities? And then thirdly, you know, every pastor and church leader has to just figure out the, the pastoral sensitivities. Like, do I have in my church a range of people that are going to have a complex or, or varying feelings about a particular event? Now, I think something like the Buffalo thing, it, it's almost in a way easy because everybody agrees that's abhorrent. You know, that everybody agrees that that's evil. Um, but how we address it is, is part of the key. Hmm. And so, yeah, it's just, it's the acknowledgement and then shifting to the thing you're an expert in <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as opposed yeah. to, you know, a mental health, political commentary, you know, racial dynamics and the history exactly. of that. If you are not, maybe you are, but you probably mm -hmm. aren't. Um, yeah. and, and I've seen so, pastors to, to fill in the conversation. I've seen pastors invite people to come and speak and host them on a panel or things like that. So there are ways to, to have other voices there. I think there's this pressure that, that we feel that we have to be the singular voice on every issue. And part of the answer for pastors feeling the weight of stacking expectations in general, and then specifically addressing issues and being the expert, is the answer is we don't have to do this alone. We need to rely on the gifts of a team. We need to rely on the gifts of others. Um, and, and there are ways of saying, hey, you know what, here's, here are a couple of interesting pieces to think about, or here's a, here's a voice in this, and maybe you're the moderator rather than the advice giver or expert giver. Um, you know, it's, it's making me think of uh, a time when I was speaking with a pastor who was addressing an issue uh, in a series that, you know, it yeah. wasn't their personal lived experience. And I suggested, you know, maybe having another speaker come for that Seg, you know, that piece of the series or doing a panel or a discussion, you know, and then they felt indignant actually, because uh. they said, as a pastor, 
I have the authority to speak into all topics. And it's Oof. just this sort of, and I, I say that as an example, because I know it wasn't, this is not a unique view to one person. Yeah. This is yeah. a thing that I think a lot of pastors feel. It's this, it's this, as you brought up about salt, we want a king. We want <laughs> right. someone to lead in this sort of way, which I think is a not a Christian way. This person who is the king, and we yeah. all bow down. <laughs> You're exactly um, right. And and contrast the king idea with in the New Testament. Obviously, Jesus is the king, the head of the church. But then you have many gifts: apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors. Many. So so many gifts, many many parts of the body. And and again, if everything has to be squeezed through the prism of our own perspective. Uh, that's a lot of pressure and our church will be worse off for it. Mm. So, you know, as we can pivot, hopefully to, you know, as we say here, there's, there's a whole book that you've written, which has a lot of amazing data trends where it's going, but we, we want to look, what's the wisdom, where's the hope, Mm -hmm. or, you know, even when I think I often think in my own world, it's just fascinating that you, you spent a lot of time in the UK is what is happening in the UK? What can we live? And I, just because I feel there are a few years ahead in terms of the secular secularization in some ways, they're different, but, but there's some ways we can learn from some of what's happening in, in, uh, the UK for churches, but where, yeah, where are you seeing, um, something that works? <laughs> Do you have an example for us of a, a di- you know, models of a different way, something yeah. you're excited about? Well, one of the things, I mean, that, that we started doing seven years ago because of a visit to the UK was Alpha. And mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to make this a commercial for Alpha. I've got nothing to gain, to gain from this. But truly, it's been a remarkable way for our people to practice a kind of radical hospitality, uh, the posture of a listener, um, I think in our church and in our context in Colorado Springs in particular, we've been very used to being the people with the megaphone, you know, the people who bark at the culture. And and Alpha taught us the skills required in being a listener and mm, and being, wow. you know, bite, biting your tongue and just saying, oh, interesting. Tell me more about that <laughs> as opposed to, well, you know, I, I've got a re- rebuttal or a response, you know. And so so not only has Alpha helped the people in our church kind of become better listeners, but it's also helped the people in our community change their perspective a bit. We get these feedback forms from people and repeatedly we hear people say things like, and it's, you know, it's a bit of the compliment that hurts, but we repeatedly, we hear people say, Oh, I expected Christians to be so mean and and narrow minded. And these were some of the warmest and nicest people I've mm. ever met. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad for that, but I'm so sad that that was your initial, you know, sort of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suspicion it's real. about yeah. us. Yeah. So Alpha has been a big part of that. But, you know, the thing that has really encouraged me as I've gotten to, to travel a little bit and yes, the UK, but also uh, in, in, in churches in different regions in the, in the U.S., we can never let go of the power of the presence of God. And I think there's something about the presence of God that witnesses to the world around us in a way that, ah, you know, clever, cleverly constructed experiences never could. So if we just say, well, let's just craft this thing and people, you know, and there's a difference. Please hear, hear me carefully, the people who are listening. We, there's a difference between being hospitable and being ready for guests and not using all insider language and all that. We got to do that. There's a difference between doing that and sterilizing the church, making it a, a place where there is nothing uniquely Christian about it, nothing that that smells of Jesus or the presence or the power mm. of God. And I, you know, in the in the book, I use this metaphor of like imagine going to the hospital needing help, and they're offering you their latte, you know, and you're like, I don't, I mean, I'm glad you have a coffee shop, but I didn't come here for the latte, you know, or whatever it might be. And I, I, I want. For all of us in our churches to hang on to this conviction that it is the presence and the power of God that can uh, awaken people from their sort of illusions of self, uh, that can convict people. Paul says it. I was just teaching this the other day. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians uh, 14. He says the unbeliever will walk in and say, surely God is in this place Hmm. and and will be convicted of sin and then say, surely God is in this place. And I mean, what a thing for Paul to say in a city like Corinth. I mean, that was like as pagan of a city as you could get. And yet Paul says to his little congregation there, hey guys, if we could 
uh, be uh, open to the Spirit in the responsible way that's grounded in the Scripture and grounded in truth and, and anchored by love, actually, that we're, we're operating in this presence and power for the sake of love, not our own goosebumps, then hang on, the world is going to uh, notice that something's different. Mm. You, um, you said on a, another podcast that I heard you on, uh, Stanley Howard was what kind of community made mm. that kind of character possible? Mm-hmm. And I think that can go either way. Yeah. Um, you, when you reverse engineer from the scandal and the debacle, what kind of community made this character possible, but also in the positive way, <laughs> Yes. you know, when I think of something, even just as something like alpha, what mm. kind of community made this kind of character or makes this kind of yes. conversation possible? Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, yeah, go ahead. You're getting up to a question. I'll let you. I'll let no, you. No, no, that. that's yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, that's where I'm seeing like, what are some of those characteristics uh, for yeah. you that, you know, we can quickly all say, well, it's the power hungry guy, it's the person who had no accountability. We we know all, no, we yeah. know all, but there's a number of those things I think we can name of like in high when we look back. Oh, that's where this happened. That's sort of like the greenhouse in which this could Mm. develop. Mm. Um, But then I guess the other way, like what are some of those characteristics um, that whether it's from your research, whether it's from, you know, experience you've seen yourself that is making um, a healthy Christ, like Christ follower community possible. Um, And maybe some of that is like, you know, (laughs) if we could reverse engineer, what does that kind of a leadership team look like? If it doesn't have just that one usually guy, but that one Mm -hmm. person at the top who has to feel like he's got to carry it all on his shoulders. I love that question so much, Joanna. And, and, and you're right. I mean, and and my answers wouldn't be from uh, research as much as they would be from, you know, I'm at a church that itself went through a scandal in 2006 and leadership transition and a shooting shortly after that leadership transition, you know, so, so we've been through some things. um, And, and I think, Gosh, what have we learned through that, and how has the Lord done this work of grace to bring us to a place of health? I think of I, I think of the way that it's made us more humble, you know, less sort of um, losing our swagger and gaining a limp, you know, where you kind of say, you know, mm. it's not about how um, how awesome we are as a church; it's about how dependent we are on God. And and then along with that humility, I think comes a deep life with God. Um, genuinely a life of worship and prayer, um, a life of, um, uh, of devotion that is hidden. And that kind of culture, it does, you know, it, it is grassroots and it has to be modeled from the top down. You know, it's both and. It, it, it doesn't work if the people are hungry and have a deep life with God and, and the leadership does not. But nor does it work if it's just the leaders do and it doesn't catch on. So I think throughout the church, uh, fostering this sort of hi- hidden life with God um, a hunger for it. And there's so much that comes with that. I mean, I'm, I'm giving that as a headline, but think of all the, the, the things that kind of go along with that. It means we can't be a church full of a ton of events and busyness. It means we can't be a church that's asking a staff to work 60, 70 hours a week, and they have no Sabbath and no um, space. It, it means we can't be a church culture that's interrupting people's vacations with last minute crises to change a service. And this, you know, uh, it, we have to be people who have created that kind of space for uh, for the, these rhythms of contemplation and rest and prayer and worship and devotion. So I think about things like that when I think that that's the, the marker of a community that is able to sort of walk in the way of Jesus. Mm. One of the one of the you know big books that 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 affected me and my colleagues in the years after the scandal was Eugene Peterson's book, The Jesus Way, um, where we're so caught up. Eugene talks about we're so caught up in doing Jesus's work, um, but we forget about Jesus's way. And mm-hmm. so the way of kindness, the way of gentleness, the way of, of humility and love, that's that's a marker of, of, of a healthy church. That's the marker of a healthy leadership team where we're not just running like crazy and, and chewing people up and spitting them out and, and churning the machine for the sake of the gospel or whatever. I mean, that's just terrible, terrible, terrible um, uh, way to run a ministry. And yet it's how so many churches run. So what kind of community makes healthy Christ-like discipleship possible? That kind of community. Hmm. And maybe um, 
as a maybe a follow-up question to this, I'm thinking of a lot of people listening who feel like maybe a ch- like I would call it a church orphan. Mm. They have had to to leave a church for probably good reason. They've yeah. they've come out of an unhealthy place and they're looking for a home. They don't they don't want to be alone. They want to be part of a community. But of course, if you've been hurt, uh, you're you're skittish about going yeah. into a new one. Um, not an exhaustive list, but is there maybe out of what you've said, maybe to turn it the from the other side, the other side of that same coin, um, what would be some things you would encourage someone to ask, whether it's a question they should ask of a new community they're, they're visiting or, or, uh, uh something wow. they might want to look for. Um, and again, not the exhaustive list that guarantees everything will be fine. Yeah. I don't mean it that yeah. way, but do you have any, you know, yeah, that's that's great, man. I love these questions, John. You're 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 making my the wheels spin here. <laughs> I, I, I my brain is turning. I'm like, yeah, that that's good. You know, I I think I would first of all want to be paying attention to the services, and if one individual or a few individual were sort of the hero of every service, uh, if the gifts of of one or two were sort of always on a pedestal, and that doesn't mean look, you could be in a large room and yet there's a kind of humility and grace from the stage where it's very obviously not uh, just about the people on the stage. Or you can be in, in small rooms and it's very clearly about the person who's on that small platform, you know. So mm. I would want to know who what you walk away with, you know, is this is this about Jesus or is this about them? Um and then I and then I would I would talk to some people who've been there a while and say, What do you love about the church? Uh, tell me about small groups at the church. Because what you're looking for is not the kind of place where people show up for a good event. And sadly, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like great church services, epic events. Um, And I would want to know, is there a life for these people beyond Sundays? Do they get together in one another's homes? Um, So it's not necessarily, not necessarily that does the pastor know everyone because that that really can't be. And even a good friend of mine is Anglican bishop in town. He he says it's not so much making sure that you care for everyone, but that everyone is cared for. And so I just, Mm -hmm. I would want to know that. Is there any work that's being intentionally done in this church that A, people are being cared for and B, that people have been encouraged and even trained and equipped for how to connect with one another? Um, though there's a one anotherness that was the mark of New Testament churches, at least Paul wanted it to be the mark of New Testament churches. You love one another, forgive one another, all of that one anothering. That if it's missing in, in our churches, that'll 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 show up. Hmm. So I would look for that. Love it. Okay, as um as a way to close, we ask these same questions. These are fun questions that we ask to everyone. The first one being, you know, in a quick way. What's a spot that you have traveled that maybe someone else has never been, you know, you know, like don't say Paris, oh, unless it's a very specific place in Paris. <laughs> I mean, what's a place that you think, whether in your hometown or, you know, where you live now or, you know, a best kept secret, where would you send people on a trip? I would send them on a trip to Lindisfarne, Holy Island off the northeast coast of England, this tiny island that became the cradle of Christianity in England and in Europe where Saints Aidan and Cuthbert were in the 500s, 600s. Special place. Oh, I love that. Okay, and what is a book that, there's many, but what is a book that has changed how you think about something? Man, I mean, so many. But I would say recently, John Barclay's book, Paul and the Power of Grace. It's a thinner summary of his bigger book, Paul and the Gift, but it's just fantastic. If you've, if you've ever wrestled with that tension between grace and works and like, how do I reconcile this and that? Uh, Barclay does just such a brilliant job by thinking of grace as gift uh, to reconcile those two things. Hmm. What's a movie in your life that has made you cry? <laughs> Almost every movie. I cry <laughs> lots. I cry I lots that. of movies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a great answer. Yeah. And the last question is you're in an ice cream shop, you know, it's one of those 50 flavor spots. What's your go-to? Man, something chocolate, something with some kind of chocolate nut, whatever, fudge, chocolate with some kind of crunch in it. I'm I'm all in. I'll take any kind. <laughs> 
Awesome. Awesome. Glenn, thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot, there's a well inside of you that I wish we had more time to draw more out of, but, um, where, if people want to connect with you, they want your book, you know, where do you want to send them today on the internet? You know, they could go to the resilientpastor.com, the resilientpastor.com, and they can find a link to the book. They can find a link to the podcast, the cohorts that we're offering, uh, the, the city round tables. Uh, and then on social media, I'm just G Pakiam, G P A C K I A M on Twitter and on Instagram. So awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna. 